welcome everybody and welcome Eric Burial from Leverage IT, one of our uh, key and uh, funding members of the Digital Maturity Group. And we are going to talk about a really, really dry and boring uh, topic today, processes. Uh, best practices to make a company run like a clockwork. Like Eric, before we jump into this topic, why why did you pick that? This is your mojo. This is your everyday. This is your mission to help companies on processes. But why? <laughs> yeah, it's a that's a great question. So I've worked with companies for over thirty years. Been internal. Uh, team members, leaders, consultants, managed departments, worked with a lot of small businesses as well. So the things that I have seen is that many, many functional departments and teams and companies have all kinds of problem scaling and being consistent in what they do. Uh, they also try to do that by putting in place policies and procedures, and a lot of it's done by um, tribal knowledge and verbal communication or written down, but when it's written down, no one knows where it is, no one knows when to follow it. When someone isn't following something, they say, look, I, I was taught and trained to do it in this way, and that's not what the organization really needs to do. So when I started to find the best performing organizations, I noticed that they were very consistent in their delivery and they were able to improve their delivery because they had documented processes and procedures that were highly valuable. It was valuable to every team member. It was valuable to their clients and it was valuable to their bottom line because they could turn on a dime, improve something, change something, and communicate that out consistently and clearly so everyone was always on the same page. And the way to do that was with processes. And I've executed in a number of different organizations myself, and certainly our organization is highly processized, and we change our processes continually. And our team uh, is continually trained off those and our clients reap the benefits of it. It's awesome. So uh, you put together like a six best practices of processes. And, and the first best practice you teach is when do you need a process? And I think it's like really important because we are like the listeners are small business owners, right? Like we don't have resources for like departments on working on processes and things like that. And And I personally know how much how much time it goes into a process, how much time to plan, uh, automate, put in, put different type of applications around that. Like, wh when do you really see something cries for a process, something needs to be done? What's the telltale signs or, or, or how, you, how, how I can identify that, oh, now it's worthwhile to talk about the process here? Right. Yeah, that's a that's a great question because everything doesn't need a process. Good news. And every pro every process doesn't need to be detailed uh, at the same level. Okay. So there's some good good you know standard rules of thumb of when something should have a written process, and it is whenever you need multiple team members to be doing the same thing. So if there's multiple team members doing the same thing, you need to tell them and train them consistently. That needs a process. When, uh, when you're training someone else, so if you know what you're doing, you probably don't need a process if you're the only one doing it because you can follow your own process. However, when you start to need to train someone else, the training of that person will go four times as quickly if you have a documented process to lead them through because the written word, the, the document pieces are unambiguous, whereas the verbal word can be interpreted by different people differently. So whenever you have um, come across something that you do more than my rule is three times. When I'm doing something that 
I'm doing and I have to do it repeatedly in a consistent manner and I've done it more than three times, I ask myself, do I need to have a written procedure checklist to follow so that I make sure that I'm doing it correctly? If I need to train someone, I've got a written document. And if I need multiple other people to do a, a consistent delivery um, of a process or a procedure or a group of steps that I'm gonna that I'm gonna write down a, a written procedure for that. It's really interesting. So you said uh, first, if you have multiple people working on the same thing, that that you know um, that goes into a process that that's that's high value. Second thing, if I have to train somebody else, or if I started doing repetitive things, which means I can delegate that to somebody else. That's really good. And, and how about, how about like, you know, somebody hit by the bus? If exactly. Yeah. Single points of failure. So we've got an accounting and human resource lead in our organization. He has a full set of his core procedures and he's a single person for that, that exact reason, because I don't know all of his processes and procedures for me to pick up his work or reassign it to someone else would be a real risk to the business if he was gone. So he has written down his processes and procedures. So if he wants to go on vacation, he can go on vacation. It's, uh, you know what? It's, it's, it's good because it's tangible. Like I can actually think of the holy smokes, what things are, well, I have something in my mind what to delegate immediately because I, ah, that was the fifth time I did that like just today. Right. So it's, it's, it's really good stuff. Uh, uh, yep. Eric, thanks. Great. So the second best practice you talk about is what makes a good process a good process. Uh, right. So what the telltale signs of a good process? When it, when, what's the quality? What's the bar? Where, right. where, to, where we can say it's a process is qualifies for a process. Yeah. There, there's some real good standards of when you are um, thinking about how to create your processes. So what makes that good process? First of all, what needs to be documented? So understanding is this a procedure document or is this a checklist? Is this a training document in the procedure or is it a mixture of all three? So understanding what needs to be documented and the level that it needs to be documented needs to be understood at the, the procedure level. How do you determine what it is that needs to be documented? Is this a step-by-step -step instruction that someone needs to follow repeatedly or is this this is a procedure for me to convey to my team the goal of this work and the tools that you use but then they're going to learn those tools with vendor documentation or training documents out of there but they know how their company does it what is their standard operating procedure on what they're using because often companies get into a situation where, where they'll send a employee to training on a tool and then they know about the tool, but your company doesn't even use a third of that functionality. You only want to say, here's how the tool is used from a training perspective. And this is what we do in using that tool. So you so document application. what we do. Yeah. What we do with that. And then the core difference between a procedure document and a checklist. So it's one of my best practices to understand the difference between a procedure document and a checklist. A checklist is I did this task. I did this task. I did this task. So I make sure that I do not miss any of those uh, tasks in a critical uh, delivery of work. The procedure is what needs to be done and how does it need to be done and why does it need to be done? So separating out the checklist because your checklist can be updated much more frequently. You're going to add and remove steps in that. So the procedure document says, this is why we're doing it. This is how we're doing it. These are the tools we're using. And when you hit this step, go to this checklist and make sure you go through each one of these individual um, steps to make sure that it gets completed. And then you come back to the procedure document, separating the two. 
Oh, Eric, that's something really profound here. Uh, uh, sorry, it's because my biggest problem when I get to this, I'm a process kind of guy and, you know, system thinking, whatever. But basically what you said is like dividing the education from the work workbook right. like like when yes. we did the learning we go through the theories and then we had the workbook so basically you are saying that any type of procedure can be like a flow chart text document little videos screen share whatever it is which explains the best practice or the process or the procedure yep. and yep. then we have something which is a little pilot list or something which is like yep. When I actually perform that, I have the indication whether I did that or not. That's exactly right. Yeah, and, 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 and which is really great because what I assume here is that many processes are not going to be checklisted all the time. But like when the individual can actually prove like five times, 10 times, 20 times they gone through the process with a checklist, it's proven. Now they can yeah. leave that out. And if we do a change... Exactly then they can go and do a couple of times with the updated checklist. It's that's really right. good. You know what? And, and that's, uh, that's one of the key factors because one of the things that hold people back is, well, I've got this whole procedure document that I've got to go through to figure out where and what I'm doing. Well, once you know why and how you're doing it, then you just grab the checklist and knock off the checklist. Then it's consistently done every time. That's really good. True. Uh, right. So the third um, best practice for that is actually what do we document? Like what right. procedures or what processes are we going to document? So what's the take yep. on this? The, these are the critical pieces, the components of a good procedure document. Okay. So first of all, it's the naming convention and versioning. You have to have some kind of naming convention and you have to have some kind of versioning and make it simple. So each one of your procedures are going to be separated by functional area. We call them business process areas, okay. uh, BPAs. BPA. And the, the naming convention starts out with um, service engineering or accounting. And then it's a description of the procedure and then version number at the end. And ours standard is uh, three digits, period, and three digits. And the uh, 001.000 is your first version. If it's in draft uh, before it's published, it is 000 .001, 002, 003. So you can iterate through a draft process and you know it's not published yet yeah, until it's 1.000. So just putting in place something like that really, really helps understand how complex and how frequently has this procedure been updated. The first portion, the 000 dot, is major revisions. The, the dot 00, one, two, three are minor revisions. So understanding the complexity, the dynamic uh, nature of that document is added by knowing how many revisions have happened to that document. Oh yeah, that's a maturity of the process as well. I, Correct, yeah. exactly. If it's if it's zero 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 dot zero zero two, it's a it's still in draft, but that's you may want people to read it and follow it. But it's not oh, finalized yet. Yeah, I, I see the value of that because I'm, I'm imagining like many times when we start uh, doing a project process or we don't really even scoop everything. And as we right. do the process, we figure, oh, that's it's another kind of thing. Right. And they start it. And that's really eliminating this type of confusion because people don't take this as granted. Like, hey, that's right. your final version. Let's do this right. from today. No, 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 no. The couple of weeks, couple of months, is going to come new stuff, create right. an issue, make a note. We address that minor or major revisions. Holy yep. smokes. I don't know. Like, honestly, sorry, but... I've been in, like, I have two master degrees, but I haven't really get this practical advice on process. Yeah. It's really, it's it's, it's really good. Oh, go ahead. It's really good. Yeah. Some of the other components, um, the title of the procedure should describe what the procedure is. Don't make it any more complex than that. What are you trying to convey with that process? So the title is important. A critical component of procedures that is often missed is who is the owner of the procedure. 
it needs to be documented that the role, the title of the procedure owner has to be documented in the procedure itself. Then that owner, that person who has that role knows that they have to train that procedure, update that procedure. They're the owner of the procedure. So that's a real critical and it needs to be done by role, not by name because people can yeah. change, right? Yeah, exactly. The, the seat. Right. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, what is the business areas that are impacted? So how many business departments functions are impacted by that procedure need to be documented. So it's an accounting and a sales procedure or it's procurement and sales procedure or it's engineering and project management procedure. So multiple business areas can share procedures. There can only be one owner. Um, then who are the users of that, um, that uh, procedure? What are the roles that use that procedure? You know, by title again. These are the people that need to get trained on it. Also, if it changes, these are the people you need to tell that it's changed because that's critical, right? Instead of trying to figure it out like, okay, well, who's getting impacted by the change here? Let me think through. Okay, we just define the roles that this procedure is pertaining to. Then when we update a procedure, we know exactly who to communicate it to. That's really um, change log. Putting in a change log is critical because then you can go back and if there is a description of a change in a procedure and it is confusing to people, you can go back to the person who made the change and say, hey, what did you mean by this? And there can be clarification and reiteration. So a change log is super, super important. Um, if you, some procedures uh, benefit from having a swim lane diagram or a workflow diagram, some do not. So think about whether a clarifying flow diagram or swim lane diagram would be beneficial. I try to include it in all of my procedures or most of my procedures, 90% of them, because it's really easy to give a high level view of which roles are impacted and what um, steps are they responsible for. A swim lane diagram is one of my favorite procedure uh, flow um, tools that I use. And then what are the steps, of course, that people are going to be going through to deliver whatever this is and then separating out checklists from the procedure can be something that is determined as well. That's a, actually what you covered is, is pretty simple. It's like a couple of uh, steps here, but like uh, if I'm, if I'm getting right, like we, we have to have a common understanding of how we are structuring this process, like right. naming convention, title, owner, and business yep. areas with all these uh, affected people, basically. Yep. That's the yep. kind of help. Exactly, exactly. Then we have these uh, description, video, swim lane, graph, whatever is the content, yep. uh, and having the steps which is going to go into this little um, uh, check, check mark uh, uh, thing. And basically, yep. we need a change log to make sure we are able to manage the change. And uh, yep. It's like really, I'm not saying oversimplifying this whole thing, but but I see the value of having like the change log and the owner and things like that, because other than that, we are just somehow dropping the ball and then we don't know actually why and we just say, oh, processes are not for us. We right. tried that once and it didn't work, right? So right. Um, it's really good and the, your next best practice here, the fourth best practice is actually really, I'm really curious about that is how do we train on pro procedures. Right. Yeah, this is, this is the heart of a process and procedure. If it doesn't get communicated, if it doesn't get trained, it's worthless. And that's what we often find. People get frustrated and they say, how many times have I told you to do this in this way? And then they create a procedure and then no one follows the procedure, yeah. even, even after they're frustrated. Yeah. So what we do is every role within an organization has a set of procedures that they have to read. Uh, they have to get trained on when they get hired. So that's defined clearly when people are getting onboarded. So if you are in this role, because you have those roles documented, you create a new procedure or an existing procedure, that new hire 
has to go through and read all of the procedures, and then they get to get that clarified in their training and onboarding process. So that's the first thing, is all procedures need to be assigned to a role, and when you hire that role, it gets trained. So if there's a procedure with no roles, then no one should be trained on it, and it's a useless procedure. Hmm. Every procedure has a role, and when you hire that role, they need to be trained on that procedure. So that's the, the key. Um, that's one of the keys. Um, every procedure is owned by a business process lead or owner, which is documented in that procedure. So they're responsible for managing, expiring, changing, and training. Whenever that procedure gets changed, they own it. And if something needs to get updated, then they review it they have the document updated either themselves or they verify that it's updated to their uh, needs. And then they are responsible for training that change and only that change to the people who are in that role because they may have been trained when they got onboarded and then we updated a piece of that procedure. They can just snip out that piece, send it to their team and say, hey, I updated procedure X. Here is the new process please let me know if you have any questions. It's as easy as that. You don't need to make it more complex than that. So um, when we go through training a procedure, we go through a four-step process. Uh, and this process can be expanded as wide as you need it to be, as complex as you need it to be. But the four major steps are the trainee watches the trainer and they open the procedure document during their onboarding training. So you're training out of the procedure and the trainee is watching the trainer go through that procedure, actually deliver that work. And then the trainee is helping the trainer, usually that business process lead. The trainee is helping the trainer do that work. Then the next step, the third step is the trainer watches the trainee do it um, the trainer helps excuse me the help the trainer helps the trainee do it and then the final step is the trainee watches the trainer do it and depending on the complexity they can go through each one of those items each one of those steps uh, can be expanded so a trainee can watch the trainer twice uh, or three times if it's real complex or confusing but you're going through the procedure document to do the training and then the next thing is, if a procedure changes, if you are going through that training process and go, oh, we don't do that anymore, you stop and you update the procedure to what it needs to be done at that time so it stays live, and then you publish it out to all the impacted users of that procedure. And it, so it's a living document. You use it to ease and make your training more effective you update it in real time by the owner of the procedure document. The trainee gets value in it, so they're excited. They're like, oh, now I see how we should be doing this. And when there's a change, you publish it out to the users. And it's simple. It's straightforward. It's really interesting because, like, honestly, it, it sounds really daunting. Uh, but I imagine uh, that, yes, so we know actually what process to, to, to actually design. We actually designed that process with your recommendations. Now, the training is pretty simple. The problem is, I think, what most people, and I feel don't think, is that without actually having these structures in place, the training is basically the tip of the iceberg. That's where things are falling apart, usually. Right. Uh, come with me, I show you the tool. Oh, you know, this is how I do that. And I expect you to follow that. But without those type of information, it's just really not fruitful. So it's not working. Uh, it's really good. Like uh, that type of thing is just really, really just. The other thing is that make sure that every role is associated to this process. Right. Make total sense. Yeah. Somehow I feel a little map in my organization yes. to have who is where and who is actually have what type of processes and which is probably right. the most important process. That's what we're going to start first. And yep. it's really good because it's, it's really actionable. So yep. um, next question is uh, uh, the fifth best practice is the change, right? So 
right. um, we know that we can create these processes and that's going to be awesome forever, right? right. <laughs> Done. Right. Yep. But it's not not what really the uh, what the life is all about. Like how nope. how you make these how you how you can make sure that these processes are going to be updated in a sense which right. is not over doing this. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So if everybody is trained on a procedure, right, and everybody gets change, uh, trained on any changes in your regular weekly cadences like EOS or gazelles or whatever, you're getting together on how are we delivering our work. And everybody says, oh, well, I was working on that procedure. However, we have a better way to do it, or we're proposing a better way to do it, or, hey, this is no longer working for us. You're, you're, you're building this um, culture of following procedures and processes. However, you can update them. The team has the capability to say, this is no longer working for us or our clients, or we have a question, we want to do it in a better way. They bring it up. It goes to the business process lead who owns that document for review and explanation or clarification. It gets updated in, a, in the uh, way that we were talking about. You update the documentation and then you publish it out. And publishing it out, we, we use Yammer to publish our changes so that we can actually put a change of a procedure out there and we can solicit feedback and questions and that might clarify a little bit for everybody why we're doing it and how we're doing it. Yammer is a great tool for that. It's really So the business process area lead who owns the procedure document, you get feedback on procedures that are working or not working or changing and we're not following it anymore in a couple different ways when they're training someone or from their team cadences saying, hey, I know we're supposed to do it this way, but I have a better way. And it, it creates this culture of, hey, we're not these things are dynamic. Our work is dynamic. We're always improving it. And we have a vehicle to make sure that if I make an improvement, it gets trained out to everybody else. Now, now I get a little epiphany here. Uh, because when you said that uh, there are different cycles of the work, like weekly cycles, monthly cycles, quarterly, right. uh, annual cycles, you can hook the different uh, uh, changes to the different cycles, like the annual, quarterly, whatever meetings. But yep. really, I, I imagine a little bit of what we do in a meeting when I call somebody in the organization, when I see something goes wrong. Like yep. Basically, what we do, we totally ad hoc assessing a process and changing a process over phone. Basically, that's what we do. Like, hey, yeah. you know, the client yeah. didn't get this, you know, email. Oh, all right, wait a right. sec. Okay, let's do this. We don't even know that unconsciously we are actually talking about a process here. Exactly. If I that's would exactly be right. able to say, wait, okay, so that's actually the uh, after purchase process. What? Are, oh, yep. that's an email we didn't put there. All right, yep. now let's put it there and send it to the people that everybody will know that and we yep. announce that it's just oh, it's kind of something eric which when you do one thing good everything follows right so right. because yep. we are just witnessing these problems and issues right. and confusion but because right. we didn't tackle the root cause which is a missing process. Oh, man. Correct. Yeah, a real world story. So just this week, we have a new engineer. He got trained on procedures. He's been with us for four or five months. And in our weekly engineering meeting, he had a question. He's like, hey, you know, on on call emergency response work, this is what I'm doing. And I think there's a problem. And we go, okay, well, first of all, let's figure out what you were told to do in your procedure document. We opened up the procedure document. What he was told, he interpreted it differently than everybody else. So we made the clarification in the document. We made the clarification to him. We clarified it for the whole team. A, a problem that could spiral out of yeah. control for months and months and months was nipped in the bud in a matter of 15 minutes. Yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, and we have your sixth best practice coming 
which is basically uh, kind of encompassing these uh, five first is actually okay. how do we store how we document how we how we make visible how we actually work on these type of process uh, do you have like a system for it or, or what's the what because i think that's where the kind of rubber meets the road like okay now right yeah so we for our clients first of all the first thing that we always say is if you don't have written procedures you need to start making written procedures don't get daunted by the complexity written procedures the experience that you make doing them or you get doing them is really important there's some really good best practices around uh, best um, process the documents themselves the procedure documents themselves and all of the work product that you have so typically you follow a process to create a product or service yes. the product is the outcome of the procedure so that's our golden rule, which is procedures, processes and procedures are kept separately from the work product that you deliver. So a process, procedure, and form are kept in a consolidated area, whether it's on your file server or in SharePoint or a, a, a process documentation tool. You want those separate. So um, we have an area in our SharePoint, which is called procedures and forms. They are only used for procedures and forms. And underneath procedures and forms, we have them by business area that we talked about. So I can look at our whole organization or our clients that follow this methodology can look at the, their organization. They have a run book of their whole company in one area. It's the procedures and forms. They can take that procedure and form and do whatever they need to do, because that is how they run their business. And then they have another area, which is also the business areas, but that's all the product of their process and procedures. So the accounting department has accounting in procedures and forms. That's all their process and procedures. And then they have accounting in their accounting department area. And that's all their spreadsheets and their invoices and everything that is the process or the product of their processes. So if I need to train someone in one area of our business or the whole business, I can say, this is how we run our business. This is how we run client education. This is how we run accounting. This is how we run HR. This is how we run operations and engineering. And this is what, how we have our run books. And this is the product of all of our projects and our engineers and our accounting and our operations. So the separation of those two areas is, is the key there. Too often I see people mixing process and procedure in with the products that they actually do. And then you wander around and it's just a big mess. Yeah, that's really good because uh, now we have a, not just a framework of when we need a process, how we, what's the minimum, how to, how to train, but actually how to store and, and what's the logistics behind that. So uh, he, because we are in digital maturity uh, group here, uh, I know you have a secret fi uh, seventh um, uh, best practice here, which is, which is applications and automation. 99% of the processes are running on applications and people implement applications without actually knowing that this is an automation of a process. They are trying to implement new software and the software application implementation fail because a missing process. And uh, as in digital maturity group on this uh, digital maturity score, one big item is process. The other big item is application and the two cannot be living without each other. We That's cannot right. create processes without knowing that these are going to be executed in different type of applications in uh, Office 365 or Excel sheets or uh, different type of line of business applications. Now, what do you think is the best practice for actually taking that consideration that all these six best practice is going to be encompassed on some form of digital application. Right. 
Yeah, that that's that's really a key component of it. The easier that you can communicate what a procedure is and when it changes, the less friction that you have between making a change and communicating it out to the people who need that process and procedure, the better it is, the easier it is, the better the culture of following that process and procedure is. So we have some really um, good tools that most businesses use today. Office 365 has some critical tools that we've used to leverage with our clients when we're automating these processes and procedures. So first of all, we use SharePoint. We have separate areas. One is processes and forms, and then one is the work area. And then we described that earlier. Um, and we have Yammer and we have Teams. These are our three core tools around processes and procedures. So when a process gets changed and updated, we snip out that component of the process and procedure. We post it into Yammer in that business area group in Yammer. Yammer is just a, a private company, Facebook-like interface. And then that team, that business area's team, gets to see the change and they can comment and they can update and they can ask questions um, around whatever that change was. In that change, you can link automatically back into SharePoint to the procedure document itself. So you're not replicating it, you're just snipping out the change and you're linking to the original document that everyone can get, oh, I, I need to see the whole thing again, refresh myself on it. And then we use Flow um, process automation, Microsoft process automation. So when someone posts something in that business area of a change, it gets automatically noticed into their Teams channel. So as they're doing work, they're watching Teams because they're working in a team. The business process lead updates a procedure. They post that procedure change in Yammer. That automatically gets published into the Teams channel and everybody immediately sees that a process has been changed and then they go in, review it, and they update it. So this automated loop is really seamless. So as soon as a change is made, the right people get notified of it and only the right people get notified of it. So other people aren't wasting their time. You're not sending an email to the whole company saying, oh, by the way, here in the file server, go and read this procedure document and see the change. Really cumbersome. No one wants to do that. And that's really, so using that automation just makes everything so much easier. And that's really interesting that uh, basically many of the applications people are using, line of business applications, they are actually constraints. Like they are, ha they, they are helping some extent to create a process because like they are creating different type of uh, screens and you go through the screens, add right. the data, ta -ta 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 -ta. and that's basically defining your process. Many times the process which is in the application is not fit to your process. That's why you can't adopt the software, which means when you are adopting a software, that's basically what you are checking beforehand, like whether it's like flexible enough or it's too flexible and it doesn't give the people the, the right uh, process. But what you are saying is basically, it just doesn't matter. What matters is that you think about your processes and you go through these six best practices and you do that. It doesn't matter what type of application you use. You can select application, whatever, but it's going to be working because you are thinking on the process, not on the application. So right, I think the that's framework. What yep. which leads to this digital maturity is that many people started using many, 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 many applications like, like, 50, 40 applications you have in your organization crisscrossing different type of processes. And if you are not thinking in process, you start thinking in applications, you fail. You fail because these applications are changing. These applications are integrated. You cannot really rely on those. You have to rely on your processes and your six best practices to get this uh, result uh, as a seventh little secret. So, uh, you know, Eric, it's really, really good. It was really an eye opener for me as well that how much we fail as a company and organization as well, uh, not utilizing these like 
uh, you know, uh, best practices. Uh, would you be able to kind of summarize this whole thing in a, in a minute, like uh, how, why you should have the process in the first place and how you run through these six best practices? Yep, absolutely. So what we've, we've found is that organizations and companies often focus too much on the tools that they're using. They're not focusing enough on the processes that they actually use to use the tools. And they're not controlling those processes consistently across their organization. And so with a little bit of framework and decisions around how you're going to instruct your team to use the tools to produce the service, to produce the products that they're delivering actually enables the company to be much more responsive, scalable, and able to improve much more rapidly than if everything is ad hoc or dependent on someone watching someone else do something. So procedures are the way that we have seen companies standardize, scale, be highly uh, client servicing, and very profitable ultimately to the bottom line. It takes less people if there is written processes and procedures. They can consistently deliver their work. And the framework that we've talked about here is very straightforward, but often people don't think about it together and how they interact with each other. If you put these best practices together, then your company will improve exponentially and in a controlled manner rather than dependent on individual talent. So it really makes individual, ordinary individuals extraordinary. That's what we say. Processes make ordinary individuals extraordinary and make an uh, ordinary company extraordinary. Uh, Eric Burial, thanks for this interview. I learned a lot. I wasn't able to take notes, but like I, my head is exploding. And uh, guys out there, the uh, digital metric group was aimed to help small businesses on digital transformation. Processes are a key component of your success as an organization. How you can create client experience, how you can uh, make your employees more productive, or actually get rid of anxiety, stress, and frustration. And uh, we created a framework with well-respected individuals, the founding members, to have a framework and a benchmark and an assessment that how you can assess where you are in this digital journey and what can be your opportunities. Most uh, business owners oversee the potential of their organization with the help of digital technologies and they don't know where to go. They have an IT company, they might have a managed service provider, these companies are really focusing on the IT infrastructure and they don't have resources and knowledge and uh, a framework to address business related problems of digital transformation. So guys, if you are interested on that, just uh, uh, follow these links and complete uh, these uh, benchmarks. We have uh, created a local advisory network so you are able to uh, get uh, a help from a local digital maturity advisor. So let's use this. It's a non-profit organization in the sense of uh, we are not charging for those type of activities. Our mission for the members are to make sure that companies out there can utilize technologies as a best, not just being an enterprise, but a small business as well. So Eric, again, as one of our uh, key funding members, thanks for your wisdom, help. And uh, yeah, uh, I have to get back and, and, and put a couple of processes together now. It's like, uh, yeah. Perfect. I Thank can you help. very much. <laughs> Thank you.